Good morning. Welcome to worship from Newland First United Methodist Church. It's good to see all of you who are here in this beautiful building with us. And those of you who are watching via the live stream, we welcome you as well. It's good to be together on this, on this Sunday. We have much to celebrate, much for which to be thankful. And uh, many things come in our way. Let me announce just a few of those. If you'll look in your bulletin, if you have that, and some of the announcements may be available elsewhere on the website and on screens as well. I want to call your attention in particular to an article in the newsletter, an announcement called to lead and serve. The nominating committee, the Committee on Nominations and Lay Leadership will meet for the first time this fall on September the 7th. And so um, there's information there about that. If you are interested in serving in a particular position, uh, we would love to hear from you. The names of the committee members are there. You can contact me anytime about that. We're looking for folks who are active, involved in the church, supporting the church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And uh, if God is calling you to serve in a particular way this year, please let us know so we can work with you on that and help us get word around. Confirmation class information is there, choir registrations, preschool, consignment sale coming up, so many wonderful things. Flu shots will be available on September the 12th. And Wednesday nights, we'll start back the week after Labor Day on the 8th of September. So keep that in mind, if you will. And then another announcement, it's not on the liturgical calendar anywhere, but we do need to remember next Sunday, Labor Day weekend is Seersucker Sunday. And uh, <laughs> if you choose to be a part of that, we would welcome you to uh, wear your Seersucker for the last time until next spring. We don't want the fashion police to, to be coming after you. So. It is good to be together. The upper rooms for September, October are available. Regular print and large print, let me remind you to pick one up. They are in the narthex and in the hallway in the other part of the building. So use that in your devotional time if you're not already. I know many of you are, and uh, it's a great publication. Please check the other announcements out. Call us if you have questions. And now I would ask you to join with me responsively in our call to worship. The voice of God is calling. Rise up and worship the Holy One.
Let us continue to worship this morning with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. seated. Friends, as we approach God in prayer, I hope that you will remember us this evening at 6.30 in here. We're having a modern worship service, one of our pop-up modern worship services. Uh, we're having a mix of modern and uh, traditional music in here as well as communion and time for prayer at the altar. Uh, if that is something you need or you would like to participate, just be here at 6.30. Uh, but be in prayer, all of you, for that service. I ask you now to hold in your heart those things that concern you, that you would bring to God, uh, to take a deep breath and to close your eyes uh, as we go to God in prayer. Gracious God, your name is victory. But not a victory to which the world aspires. Rather, God, your victory wore a crown of thorns and knelt to wash feet. God, your victory took on sin and shame and carried a cross. Your victory showed us a way through fear to peace. And your victory dismantled death and gave rise to resurrection. God, this morning I am thankful for your invitation to participate in that victory to choose peace over fear, to carry our own cross on the pathway to mercy and forgiveness, to kneel at our neighbor's feet, to become servants to all, and to become partakers of resurrection now. God, that is our prayer this morning as we look around, look at the world. We ask that your resurrection would take place now. May it be so in our community, in our nation, in our world. We ask for the hope of your resurrection to take place now. We ask for the hope of your resurrection to take place in Afghanistan where hope and peace are desperately needed. We ask for the hope of your re resurrection to take place in Haiti where so many have been left with nothing and where hope is frail. God, may your resurrection's hope hold Louisiana and all in the path of Hurricane Ida in the palm of your hand. And may the hope of your resurrection hold the families of those who were killed this week in the attacks. May it hold those families close. God, may the power that raised Christ from the dead make its home in our hearts that we might find hope in the ashes. May our resurrected King resurrect us. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus, who gave everything for us and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able and join as we sing hymn number 549, where charity and love prevail. Will you stand as we sing?
Amen. Our scripture this morning comes to us from Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. Okay. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, that's pretty straightforward. We could do the closing hymn and be on our way, but... We'll say a little more about that. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Chancel Choir. I think the first time I heard that anthem was at Andrew's Chapel, United Methodist Church in Jonesboro, Georgia, years ago, and uh, have loved it since the first time I heard it. And it's going to be in my head and in my heart for a while now, and I'm grateful for that. We're thinking about thou shalt not murder or you shall not kill, different versions. And uh, I just felt led to uh, read these names this morning. I know there were others who have been killed in Afghanistan this past week, folks who speak different languages, folks whose names are difficult for us to remember and pronounce, but God knows. But these are the names of some folks that we can pronounce from our land. So. I'm going to read these names and ask we have a moment of silent prayer and then I'll actually begin the sermon. We're thinking about you shall not kill. Marine Corporal, Marine Corps Lance Corporal David Espinoza. Marine Corps Sergeant Nicole G. Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Darren Taylor Hoover. Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Noss, Marine Corps Corporal Hunter Lopez, Marine Corps Lance Corporal Riley McCollum, Marine Corps Lance Corporal Dylan R. Marola, Marine Corps Lance Corporal Kareem Nakui, Marine Corps Corporal Dagan William Tyler, Marine Corps Sergeant Johanny Rosario, Marine Corps Corporal Umberto Sanchez, Marine Corps Lance Corporal Jared Schmitz, and Navy Hospital Corpsman Max Soviak. God says you shall not murder. Other translations read you shall not kill. According to Terence Fratham, the basis of the sixth commandment is that all life belongs to God. Life is thus not for human beings to do with as they will. They, we, are not God. It is up to God to determine what shall be done with life. Human beings are never to kill on their own authority. Another scholar reminds us the one who kills is acting as if he or she were God. All life is God's creation. And I believe that this is the fundamental meaning of the commandment. All human life is sacred. It doesn't matter whether that life is represented by the best known celebrity or athlete on the planet or by an unnamed child on the street in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. There's no difference in the eyes of God. I mentioned a moment ago the way this commandment is recorded in different translations of the Bible. Some say you shall not murder, others you shall not kill. Most of my references seem to believe that kill is the more accurate translation of the Hebrew, though there is debate about that. Certainly scholars don't agree. But that broadens the meaning of the commandment. It says to me that the commandment must be considered in all of our debates regarding topics such as capital punishment and suicide and abortion and euthanasia and war. As Christians, we cannot always avoid the controversy that surrounds these life and death issues. And Certainly we don't have time this morning to delve into all of those, but that might be worth doing sometime soon. Briefly, what did Jesus have to say? 
killing, said Jesus, can be traced to the anger that is that broods in the human heart. Not all anger is evil and destructive. It can be turned to positive means and ends, but unchecked anger can sometimes boil over and lead to loss of life. By the grace of God, we must control the rage within us or else that rage will one day control us. You shall not kill. That's so basic that it should go without saying. It should. But obviously it's not being said loudly enough and it's not being said often enough and we're not hearing it well enough. As the people of God in this day and age, we must affirm clearly, loudly by our words and by our deeds that all human life is a gift of God, our creator, and that it is therefore precious and sacred. And it is to an elaboration of that affirmation that I now turn for for just a few moments. The sixth commandment. The commandment against murder is short and unadorned. You heard it read just a moment ago. While scholars continue to sort out the exact meaning of the term murder, the main point is clear. Human life belongs to God, must be respected. Walter Harrelson takes a maximum view of the prohibition and interprets it broadly as a reverence for life, for all human life. And then another Walter that you may have heard of, Walter Brueggemann, and I believe he taught at Columbia Presbyterian Seminary in Decatur for several years, quite a writer. In his reflection on Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, he has this to say, that the prohibition on killing asserts that human life is valuable to God and is under God's protective custody. No doubt distinctions and differentiations are to be made in enacting this command. The most obvious of these now before us concern capital punishment, war, abortion, euthanasia. Biblical scholars, interpreters are no single mind on these great questions and no consensus is apparent. The commandment itself states a non-negotiable principle and nothing more, he says. And he goes on to say that, however, is a great deal in a society where life is cheap, where technology is impersonal, where greed is unbridled, where bombs are smart, and where ideology is powerful. The murder that makes the newspapers signifies a breakdown of the human infrastructure, which legitimates brutality. The murder behind the headlines, that is the killing that happens a little at a time, mostly unnoticed and unacknowledged, is kept ideologically obscure. Such slow, unnoticed description and destruction diminishes human life among those not powerful enough to defend themselves. The issue may be this, if human life is precious, what public policies are required in order to enhance it and protect it? Human life is a gift of God and therefore is precious and sacred and valuable. And according to some less than exhaustive research that I did, I, I tried to Google this this past week, the value of the chemicals in the human body, and I came up with different numbers. One said $576. I, I've heard much lower numbers, and some of you may, may know what that is. But we're more than physical bodies, aren't we? And how do you put a dollar figure on the totality of a human being? Perhaps by their net worth? By measuring their assets and their liabilities? Is that where we turn? There was a day in this country when slave traders bought and sold human beings. Price tags were affixed to children of God. And thank God that system collapsed under the weight of its own sinfulness. We have strayed from the straight and narrow when our measuring stick is dollars and cents. When we think we can put a value on a human life and measure it in those terms. What happens when we engage in behavior and speak words that kill someone's spirit? Eroding their confidence, destroying their hope, discouraging their efforts. Are we in violation of the sixth commandment when that happens? Many of you are familiar with the small book, the one that was written by the late Bishop Reuben Job. It was published, oh, I think, 14, 15 years ago now, entitled Three Simple Rules. 
and they're taken from our denomination's general rules. First, do no harm. Second, do good. Third, stay in love with God. In the study guide for that book, Gene Finley has some comments that line up with what we're talking about this morning. I want to make note just a couple of those. She said, when we look at John Wesley's rule to do no harm, we may ask, what harm am I doing? We examine ourselves for ways we might hurt other people, gossiping, taking revenge on our enemies, undercutting a co-worker's efforts, starting rumors about people we don't like, making someone else look bad. In other words, devaluing a human life that God deems valuable. And then she goes on for just a moment. Do you remember preparing to give your driver's license? Maybe you had a little book to study to learn the rules of the road. Maybe you went to a driving school or took a class in school. Either way, you learned a number of basic rules. And when you sat down behind the wheels of a car, you had to think about those rules. But after you became experienced as a driver, those rules became second nature to you. Now, you probably don't think of them much at all. And if asked about their reason for being, you might look at the questioner in doubt and disbelief and say, what do you think? Why do you think we have those rules? They keep us from hurting and killing each other. Many of us learned the Ten Commandments before we learned the rules for driving. Some of them were never intentionally break. We would never intentionally break. Do not kill. Do not steal. Others we break when it seems harmless to do so. Remember the Sabbath and do not covet, for example. Most of us give little thought, she said, to the ethical principles behind these commandments. Why did the Israelites and their descendants in the faith, which includes us, need the Ten Commandments? The simple truth is we need them so that we don't hurt and kill each other because human life, all human life, is a gift from God. And we just somehow forget that. Precious, sacred, valuable. You shall not kill. Is it possible to be in violation of the sixth commandment without actually taking someone's physical life? By the words we speak, perhaps. A Boy Called Combustion is a book that someone in my last church gave me. It's about growing up in 1940s Mississippi, and it was written by a doctor, a medical doctor, who practiced in Atlanta for several years. And one of the stories he tells in the book is simply called The N-Word. Dr. Keaton was seven years old when this story unfolded. He said, one day I was walking down toward my grandfather's store, and I met a sweet-looking little old black lady. Hi, N-word, was my greeting. At first, this lady lowered her head and looked away, and then things changed. Young man, I heard her call, call out after she had walked about five steps past me. I knew immediately I was in way over my head. Getting into trouble was something that was not new for me. I was familiar with this, but, but this was new. Ma'am, I said, trembling as I turned around. And this in itself was an arresting response. The children in my family were taught to say sir and ma'am to most people who looked older than 12. But we usually didn't address black people that way. Come here, she said. I slowly stepped toward her. With a stern look on her face and pointing a finger at my nose, she asked, did you go to Sunday school yesterday? Yes, ma'am, I whispered. Putting her finger at me again, she asked, is that what they taught you in Sunday school yesterday and in school today? No, ma'am, I replied. Then why did you say that? Of course, I had no answer for her. Now it was my head that was lowered, my eyes that looked away. They were filled with tears. As someone who tested every imposed boundary while growing up, I was constantly called down and put in my place. But never before or since have I been more ashamed. The lady was a complete stranger whom I had insulted for no reason whatsoever. Even worse, I had insulted her, assaulted her in a sense with a word that I really didn't understand except to know that it was wrong. I've wished, he said, for the opportunity to, to apologize to her, to tell her what an impact she had on my life. I never knew who she was, I never saw her again. Yet I've never forgotten her and still think of her often. 
I think the reason that our encounter was powerful is that it had to do, at least in part, with the woman's manner. She behaved with a dignity that showed up just how undignified and nasty and disrespectful my own behavior had been. She used a minimum of words and explanation. She not only had the courage to confront me, she had the composure and self-respect to do it without hurling any epithets in return. In that encounter, one of us was clearly a far better human being than the other. And we both knew who that was. If the crime scene investigators, the CSI folk, were looking for the murder weapon and stumbled upon a pile of words, would any of those words happen to have our fingerprints on them? Once again, is it possible to be in violation of the Sixth Commandment simply by the words we speak? Do we break that commandment every time we devalue another mortal? Even though there's no danger of being indicted or convicted or incarcerated or executed, many folks label, labor under the illusion that by devaluing other people, that by putting other folks down, they lift themselves up. And it never has worked. That doesn't work. There are not many notions that could be further from the truth. But truth be told, we can employ our words and our actions to build others up, to add value, to increase life in those places where death and destruction are gaining more than a toehold. Refraining from killing, from murder, of course, we want to do that. That's a good thing. Using our words and our deeds to convey hope and strength and encouragement and reassurance and joy. That's a better thing and the best thing. Coming to believe how valuable we are, how valuable all persons are in the eyes of God. You shall not murder, you shall not kill. Why? Because his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches you and me. You shall not murder, you shall not kill, why? Because God so loved, God gave an only son. Perhaps God has valued us, valued you and me and others too highly. And if that be the case, the only thing I know to say is thank God. Amen. We come now to that time in the service when we receive God's tithes and our offerings. Know that these gifts are used for ministry in this community and around this world. And if you so designate your gift for the United Methodist Committee on Relief to be used in Afghanistan or Haiti, you might do that and we'll be sure that it gets to the right place. We can make a difference. We can show that we love and that we care. If the ushers will come forward at this time, we will receive God's tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Receive these, our gifts, O Lord, gifts from our hearts, that they might be blessed and multiplied and make a world of difference close by and around the world that you love so much, you gave an only son. Bless these gifts. We offer them to you in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. And if you would remain standing, our closing hymn is not in the hymnal. It will be on the screen and it's in your bulletin. His eye is on the sparrow. Now will you receive the benediction. Go in peace. And may the God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you and remain with you from this day forward and forevermore. Go from this place doing all that you can, saying all that you can to enhance human life all around us. Go in God's name. Amen. <laughs>